Hello, I'm Beryl Dakers, welcoming you, our South Carolina educational television viewers, listeners of South Carolina Public Radio, and viewers and listeners from throughout the nation joining us for this historic Total Solar Eclipse Live program. In just seven minutes, the full eclipse will start in Clemson, South Carolina, where all it will last for about two and a half minutes, then present southward toward us here in Columbia. And a mere 11 minutes later, exit the Palmetto State, the last state in its momentous transcontinental journey across our country. We are anchoring this broadcast live from the South Carolina State Museum in the capital city of Columbia, South Carolina. However, we do have team coverage in three remote areas throughout the state, including Clemson University, where we will join you with reporter Gavin Jackson, who is uh, in Clemson, South Carolina. Of course, here in Columbia, reporter Tut Underwood is also with us. He is smack dab in the middle of a baseball game at Spirit Communications Park. And then we will wind up our coverage with reporter Victoria Hansen, who is along the coast in Charleston, South Carolina, at the College of Charleston campus. We will be touching down with our reporters just momentarily, but first, this all-important message about when and how to use these great safety glasses. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. We interrupt this broadcast with the following important announcement. You are about to experience the total solar eclipse of 2017. A once-in-a-lifetime astronomical event so awesome, you'll be boring your grandkids with the story for years to come. However, when viewing this or any other solar eclipse, there are certain precautions that you, the viewer, must take in order to safely observe the sun. As you may know, the sun is that bright, gigantic ball of burning gas that is impossible to stare at with the naked eye without causing permanent damage to your eyeballs. We're serious about this. Never stare directly at the sun. Because of the path of the eclipse, many of us will have the chance to view it in spectacular fashion. But first, never look at the sun without the proper safety eyewear leading up to and after the totality of the eclipse. That's when the moon will be blocking the sun's blinding rays for about two minutes as it passes overhead. You must use special purpose solar filter eclipse glasses to view the sun. Make sure your eclipse glasses are compliant with the ISO International Safety Standard and says so printed on the glasses. Follow the directions that come with the glasses and do not use the glasses if they are scratched or damaged in any way. Stand still and cover your eyes with eclipse glasses before looking at the sun and turn away from the sun before removing them. Do not look at the uneclipsed or partially eclipsed sun through an unfiltered camera, telescope, binoculars, or other optical device. This includes cell phones. Remember, you can only view the eclipse without the glasses when it's entirely blocked by the moon and must put the glasses back on before the sun begins to shine again. Now, be careful, have fun, and eclipse on. Okay, glasses at the ready. Joining me here at the anchor desk in the Columbia area are Dr. Nate Carnes, who is a professor of science education with the University of South Carolina's Department of Edu College of Education. And immediately next to me is meteorologist John Carriarello, who is with the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. That's a mouthful, otherwise the National Weather Service here in Columbia. Dr. Carnes, based on what we've just heard about using the glasses, we know that everyone in South Carolina who is literally viewing the partial eclipse right now needs to have donned their glasses. Why is safety such an important factor? Safety is extremely important for the eyes and it's such a sensitive member of our body that if not followed correctly, it can render a person blind or partially blind. Well, we are here at the South Carolina State Museum where we have the luxury of seeing the eclipse through the fantastic telescope imagery available for us. We know that this is the home of that fabulous 1926 Alvin Clark telescope in the Boeing Observatory. However, that's not the telescope we'll be using. No, we're going to be using the smaller telescope that's mounted on top of it because it gives a clearer image and will broaden out enough for us to see the eclipse in its entirety. All right. Now, John, what can we expect? Uh, it's already getting a little bit darker here, and we're in partiality, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Viewing conditions actually look pretty good across most of the state, but as we're going to see, as we start to get to the total eclipse, temperatures will actually start to fall a bit. Winds might even become a little bit lighter, and we actually might see a decrease in cloud cover here over the next hour or so. 
am I imagining it or are we already feeling that temperature drop because it was hot as the Dickens here a little bit earlier. It's not so unbearable it right at temperatures have probably already dropped a couple of degrees and we'll keep track of that here throughout the broadcast. You know, we talk about what kinds of atmospheric changes we can anticipate. Have we seen anything leading up to the eclipse itself that is uh, noteworthy? Well, already where uh, other parts of the country have experienced the eclipse, we're seeing reports of temperatures already dropping uh, several degrees, if not more, in some locations. And uh, we, we expect some areas could see winds, uh, excuse me, temperatures fall as much as 5 to 15 degrees, uh, depending on the humidity and the cloud cover in different locations throughout the country. What is so important about a total solar eclipse that they say you can have witnessed a partial eclipse that's maybe almost 99 percent but if you hadn't seen the real thing that's a hundred percent you haven't seen the real thing that's why correct. is that that's correct because the total eclipse is so intriguing because what we're going to see is dusk 360 in a 360 degree rather than setting in the west it's going to set all around us and then it's going to become night and then dawning of another day all within a day fabulous well we will be heading to clemson in just a second to see what kinds of changes are already there because in just about a minute totality will occur gavin can you let us know the scene there Hey, Beryl, yeah, you know, you just tossed to us right now, and it is getting dark right now. We're right here at the South Carolina Botanical Gardens. You might be able to hear people chanting and hollering. We have a great clear sky out here in Clemson. We're in the northwest corner of the state, so we are the first part of the state to see this. And it is dark. You can see, can you even see me on camera anymore? This is something remarkable. We can almost, oh, we can see the diamond rings. I might have looked without my glasses, but we can see the phenomena happening right now. We have total solar eclipse right now on a clear day in August. This is remarkable. We are about to cut away so people can enjoy this moment of totality in its entirety. It is exhilarating. You can tell by the volume of my voice that I'm excited about this. We have our glasses off. We are looking at a complete total solar eclipse here in Clemson, South Carolina. We are the last state to see this solar eclipse and we are getting quite the show up here in Clemson. Let's enjoy it for a moment. Beryl, you heard me get really excited, and I think we just didn't know what to expect. I mean, everyone says you're not going to know how it feels until it happens, and we had a lot of cloud coverage throughout the day. We were getting a little worried. We had a clear morning. It's still somewhat cloudy around the eclipse, but we have a clear, clear shot of it. Hope we get some photos of it so you can see it, but it is just awe-inspiring to see this moment. It is dark. We hear the locusts. We hear the tree frogs in the trees. We hear people clapping. A lot of people are just silent and just looking and taking it in. Everyone's using their camera phones to look at this. I mean, it, you can see the, the corona perfectly here in Clemson, which is that superheated gas that surrounds the sun, which we can't typically see with, with the naked eye because of its intensity. But now we see it perfectly with the, the full moon blocking the sun right now. Sounds like it's very quiet there, so people are awestruck. But as totality wraps up in Clemson, of course, the anticipation is building right here on the grounds of the South Carolina State Museum. Folks are about to get rowdy as we are much closer to totality here in Columbia. It is getting visibly darker. Let's talk about the skies for just a moment, John. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, fortunately, most of the state uh, has what we call uh, those afternoon cumulus clouds out there. So if you have a few breaks in those, you should be able to see the eclipse. The only exception would be along the coast where we have a lot more cloud cover today, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, as the eclipse comes through, we actually might see the cloud cover start to decrease here, uh, maybe within the next hour or so as we lose some of that, that heating from the sun. Well, I'm wondering what that portends for that Fireflies game that's going on over at Spirit Communications Park. Tut, what's happening over there at the ball game? Beryl, the excitement is building. The people are buzzing like bees. It's getting darker. It's very dim now. You can see, actually, behind me, the Fireflies are lying on their backs on the field looking up at the sky with their glasses. The crowd is holding all their glasses to their eyes and looking up. 
There's a great sense of anticipation. I see a lot of uh, cameras flashing out in the audience. So this is an amazing thing. And it's something that, of course, most of these people have never seen and never will see. But it's, it's an awesome thing to be a part of. And here it's getting even darker. Uh, I said awesome a minute ago. I want to tell you, I've always thought that the word awesome was overused. People say awesome when they mean good, when they mean I like it. But this is truly awesome. This is a celestial event that is unmatched by anything we can do on Earth. Both teams actually are lying on their backs, looking up at the sky. It's getting darker, even darker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up here real quick. Oh, and I see, of course, the last little sliver. I can't see the Bailey's beads yet, but it ought to be any second now. It's an electric feeling. People are yelling, come on, come on. They're cheering. You can hear them cheer. OK, Beryl, take it to you. You can actually hear a cheer here at the State Museum because it's almost as though someone just cut the lights out. There was an eerie calm going on, and now everybody is very excited. we gazing skyward. We are donning our eclipse glasses so that we can look as well. Uh, this is just amazing, guys. Do take a look and make sure that we are not missing out on this site. And there she goes. We are enveloped in complete, complete darkness here. This is what totality is all about. Pretty incredible. It's almost like a, I don't know, a mystical experience as you mm -hmm. sit here in one day. The other thing about it, though, is in addition to the fact that this is such a fabulous sight, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a little uh, uneasy, I don't know. <laughs> when you look about and there's no sun, it's in the middle of the day, it's, it's unnerving. To and we were talking earlier, Beryl, about uh, some of the natural organisms' responses. But have you noticed that the photosensors, photosensors and some of the lights have also reacted and now they have come on? Absolutely. It's, it's nighttime for all, all purposes here. But what is yes. that that we see, that glow going out from the sun? What is that glowing? That is the corona of the sun. So that is normally barely, barely visible or invisible to us because of the brightness of the sun. But because now that light of the sun is blocked, we can see the corona or the outer uh, sphere of the sun now glowing. Now, I'm curious because I know that this event was last seen in a portion of South Carolina, I think back in 1970. We are told that we will actually experience another total solar eclipse in 2024. 2024, which will be a partial eclipse. But they have total solar eclipses almost yearly someplace on the globe. But not always on uh, the continental uh, uh, of America because the un, uh, people don't understand that the moon doesn't go in this single track around the earth exactly the same time each time. But because of gravity and other forces, it varies. John, talk about what's happening atmospherically. Well, right now we're losing our solar radiation, so we pretty much, it, it's almost like it's nighttime right now. We're gonna see temperatures start to fall. Uh, we're gonna see cloud cover start to dissipate. Winds have already lightened up. You could feel there's not much of a breeze out here right now, and that's what we're experiencing. So it really, uh, it's really neat to see how the atmosphere responds to the loss of uh, the incoming sunlight. How, how long does that change last? I know that the light will begin to come back as we are beginning to see the eclipse move away, just a sliver, a sliver of light peeking through at this time as we are in partiality, entering partiality again. Can we now take off the glasses and look? No, at this point now we, we need to the have glasses the glasses on, on because now we can start seeing the sun. But we'll actually see the coolest temperatures uh, occur about 10 to 15 minutes from now. It takes a little time for the atmosphere to respond to that. So. Uh, about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, we'll feel our coolest temperature due to this eclipse. Are there any lasting changes during the eclipse, or is it just that momentary thing while the total eclipse is in effect? Most of it's while it's in effect. Some of the uh, general effects could last an hour or two until the temperatures start to recover again, and maybe winds start picking back up to where they were. That, that takes a little bit of time. There's a little bit of a lag there, but 
for the most part, it's, it's a pretty short duration within a couple of hours of the actual totality. It is such an amazing thing to have witnessed this uh, with groups and crowds of people, and yet it is a very singular, solitary experience to see the eclipse itself. It is. And Victoria, I think it is headed your way as the sun is slowly emerging from its hiding place here in Columbia. We are heading down to Charleston at the College of Charleston site with Victoria Hansen. You got it. You came to me just in time. I mean, the street lights just came on. We've all had our glasses on looking at just the final moments. And now it looks like we are in totality. I am at the College of Charleston, as you mentioned. And you can hear behind me, I'm gonna step out of the way. We have at least 1,500 students and faculty members here. Of course, NASA's been broadcasting live as well. And people talked about perhaps silence. Yeah, that's not the case here at the College of Charleston. So we had the incoming freshmen in today. Yes, the incoming freshmen came in today, a class of about 2,100. And basically they went through convocation between 9.30, 11.30. This was their big party. And what you can't see, there are actually students outside of the gates trying to climb in. Uh, what you see also in the distance there is the big screen for NASA where they get to watch the eclipse live as we're watching as well. It has been extremely hot, extremely humid here. I would say the temperature dropped at maybe 15 degrees. It's so much cooler. There's a bit of a wind, which is really nice. And it got dark really, really fast. And they said that was what would happen if we had cloud cover. We certainly had plenty of cloud cover here today. Let's go ahead and listen in again. And of course, the kids are chanting CFC, CFC, CFC. So uh, yeah, this is, this is the final stop, so to speak for the great eclipse of 2017. And I can't help but think that, you know, in a time of cell phones and social media and selfies, it's something else to see something so much bigger than us all. So. All right, Beryl, as you can see, and people have finally, yeah, they've finally gotten quiet. I mean, how do you get 1,500 college students quiet, right? Oh, never mind. I think it's just the awe-inspiring impact of the eclipse itself. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing that um, we have all of these natural wonders in the world, but for whatever reason, the total solar eclipse is considered to be the most beautiful natural phenomenon of all, surpassing even the aurora borealis. Why is that? I think uh, because we're so involved in it, I mean, just it's so amazing that there's something happening in outer space that's affecting us directly right here on the Earth. Yeah, I think it's just a great scientific experiment for you know millions of Americans to pretty much experience this, to not only see the eclipse, but then to experience the impacts from that, whether it be the temperature dropping or the you know change in animal behavior. So it's really just a, a great way for, for people to be involved in science and, and see the results. I have no idea uh, about the various experiments, but I know that you weather guys have, are dropping balloons like crazy and you've got all kinds of things going on. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great opportunity for us to really sample what's going on in the atmosphere right now. So for example, uh, the Weather Service office down in Charleston is releasing uh, weather balloons every two hours to sample the atmosphere prior to the eclipse, during the eclipse, and then after the eclipse to see what changes take place. So it's a great, great opportunity for some research. Wow not sure exactly what's going on there and how <laughs> we will be able to uh, benefit from it, but you get these little bits and pieces of information and yet we've been able to eclipse, uh, to predict the eclipses with remarkable accuracy for centuries, not just a couple of years, literally centuries. Yes, I, I think that's a, a function of growth in technology that we've been able to pinpoint various events and so forth. And there's a lot that goes into this modeling. Uh, and I know uh, Don can speak to this a lot, in which in the laboratories they uh, test things over and over until we get this level of accuracy. 
what do we do with the little tidbits of information? Because it seems that what we actually learn are, are, are just little increments of, of, of matter that we, we, we put together, but it's not that we get any big overriding discoveries as a result of that. Well, I think any small amount of information that we could get from this uh, kind of helps build a bigger picture and an understanding of what's going on in the atmosphere in general and, and in space. Uh, so I, I think it's really a great opportunity for us to uh, experience this and to, to really see how uh, space impacts what we see here down on Earth, whether you know, it be uh, various things that we just experience as eclipse move through. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about happened to have been shadow bands, and I'm really curious, we're going to go back to Clemson for just a second, where uh, Gavin Jackson has been joined by Patrick McMillan, the host of Expeditions. Gavin? Hey, how you, can you guys see us? Okay, well, we just got Patrick McMillan here, host of Expeditions with Patrick McMillan, and also Clemson professor Patrick McMillan. So, <laughs> yeah. you just jogged over here. Tell us what your initial observations of this eclipse were like. Well, uh, you know, people come to me asking what uh, nature's response is going to be to an eclipse, and really the responses are more uh, for Earth science than they are for natural science. So. You can't b but awe over that aura when you get total eclipse. And you heard everybody going crazy, and there's a reason for that. Stars come out, you know, it's, it's just a totally cool experience. But when it comes to nature's reaction, you know, you don't see bats flying around, usually. <laughs> You're not going to see cicadas come into full chorus. Tree frogs didn't sing. Hummingbirds still flew, butterflies still flew, and the daytime insects were still singing. But you can hear right around us right now, crickets are still singing, and we're, you know, three quarters eclipse on the back end now. Mm -hmm. So nature does respond, but I think they respond more in shock. <laughs> than <laughs> A little bit like just us, like right? us, Just like <laughs> us, yeah. So it's not, you know, flowers didn't open, that they're not blooming, it's yeah, just too short. Yeah, we didn't see anything move around no, here. No, 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 no. You're not gonna see things slithering around that come out at night, mm -hmm. because it is just a very short, but shocking moment. But speaking of things slithering around, and I know Beryl just talked about this a moment ago, uh, did you see the shadow bands? Because we oh, saw yeah. some out here, and what was that experience like to see? Right, so we actually had some white paper out on the table, uh, getting some video, some image of that, um, because you know the shadow bands are created by the light filtering through the valleys and the craters on the moon as, as it, it hits us. So it's mm -hmm. just, um, it's awe-inspiring to think about. You know what you're seeing there, and then I don't know if you saw the crescents, but you can we still did see a little bit. Yeah, we had some of that. Yeah, still we, <laughs> yeah, you still can see crescents, and for the next few minutes, you'll still be able to see those crescents as well. And that's kind of like the pinhole effect that a lot of people exactly. are probably seeing right it's, now. It's just like back in the '70s when I was a kid, and we created a little p cardboard pin mm -hmm. pinhole. You can see the crescent, you can watch the progression. And I know Patrick, we're going to come back to us uh, a little bit in, later in the show, but yeah, have you ever experienced? I mean, what can you compare this event to? You've traveled all over. Anything that you can... Well, I saw this back in 1979. Okay. <laughs> so I you, am you that can't old. compare it to Yeah, that. I am that old. <laughs> but in 1979, we all didn't have glasses to see it. Um, we didn't have social media, and we didn't have the communication we have now. And um, I'm telling you, it was more than just the eclipse. It was the experience of seeing thousands of people come out to the botanical garden and enjoy life and to celebrate life through the eclipse event mm -hmm. and through fellowship with the land and fellowship with each other. Right. Oh. And tree frogs are singing. Yeah, we. we so, <laughs> I mean, it was very frogs. eerie here oh, right really before strange, it got really that. Strange. It wasn't even like twilight. It got a weird haze, mm -hmm. like we haven't seen at twilight mm -hmm. before. I mean, was it quiet up where you were too? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, everything goes pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. um, birds sang right up until dark, and then like whoa, you yeah. know. But it really was short lived. Yeah. You know? All right, guys. Well, that's us here in Clemson. I know you'll come back to us, but Beryl, we're going to send it back down to you in Columbia. Thank you. You know, now that <laughs> it's amazing to think that it has come and gone, but when we look at it, we know that the total eclipse began on the West Coast and it has traversed all the way a country, across the country, cutting a narrow 70-mile swath, I guess, across the country. Even so, with all of the thousands and thousands of people who are predicted to have come out, turned out to see it, less than 1% of the population of the continent actually got to experience it. That's an incredible statistic. It is very, it is incredible, uh, particularly since that band is so narrow, but it also emphasizes the size of the moon compared to that of the sun, which is much larger than the moon, but yet it did block out the light because of, it, of, of its shadow. So we're very fortunate that it came right over us. Now, I know that eventually, after millions of years, there will be no more total, total solar eclipses. 
at least not visible on this continent. But in the interim, are we going to see a narrowing of the the blocked out disk or will it be imperceptible to the human eye? Actually, what our data shows right now is that we will have uh, the next total eclipse will be a longer one. We were, what, about two minutes two and, and 36 half. seconds or so. Um, well, we, we could conceivably, or someone in the continental U.S. will be looking at one that's about seven minutes. And that is because of the, the, the rotation as well as it, the revolutions? Well, <laughs> it has to do with the orbit. It has to do with the orbit uh, of the moon. It, it will be at a point, and, and also, the distance that the moon is from the earth relative to the sun also makes a difference. All right, now, John Q, I know that you've been peeking over there looking at statistics, I suppose, from some of the, the experiments that are going on. What have you found out? Well, right now, uh, uh, Richland County, where we're located, uh, has a network of observations uh, here in the county, and there's one right here at the State Museum. And from what I could tell, right before the eclipse, we were up to about 94 degrees here, and uh, right now it's down to about 89 degrees and it still might drop another degree or two uh, before the temperatures start rising once again so we've obviously seen the temperatures drop just like we, we felt for ourselves and, and, and now the data is showing that that did occur well i'm going to put my money on <laughs> hoping that it will be depressed for a little while <laughs> at least i'm not anxious to see that 94 return uh over at spirit communications park tut has the play resumed Yes, the playing has resumed, Beryl. The score is five to three in front of the home Fireflies. It's the bottom of the fourth, and everybody's excited and making noise again after they're cheering for the uh, eclipse. And right now, I've got a special guest with me. I've got Jody Zeiss. Jody is the regional coordinator for the Midlands STEM Centers, South Carolina. And Jody, first, let me just get your general reaction to the eclipse. It was the absolute most awesome thing in nature ever seen. It was amazing to hear people all around me who probably wouldn't normally be excited about stuff like that. Totally in awe. The kids were excited. It was just, it was breathtaking. Do you think that an event like this could inspire people or, or help people in STEM education to enter it and, and get involved with more scientific uh, uh, courses of study and careers? Yes, what I'm really excited about this particular event is it not only excited teachers and students, but it excited parents in the community, business and industry, manufacturers all around. So I'm hoping now that we can take this momentum and create a collaborative and do a lot more outreach and keep this STEM initiative and STEM momentum going. Very good. You know, do you, do you have a favorite part of the eclipse that you think might be especially valuable for STEM education? Um, I just think the whole experience itself because there's so many simulations and models and scale models that you can do with students and keep talking about it. Like I said, if you keep the momentum going, it's just that whole experience. The fact that the kids and the families were here in South Carolina or along the path of totality experiencing it, it's getting that spark going. That's great. I, I, the diamond ring for me was really neat and to see it, the total sun go out through my glasses. What, what did that do for you? I didn't even know what to say, which is really unusual. And just to see the corona, like you can just see the different sparks coming out. And then when the diamond ring came, you were like, that was it. I was here. I did that. It, it was just absolutely breathtaking. One of my sons said he was never so excited and proud to have a geek as a mom. So it made me proud. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you, Jody Zeiss. We appreciate it very much. Vera, we're going to send it back to you. We're still watching the ball game and watching the after effects of the uh, second part of the partial eclipse. Thank you, Tut. We are talking, he's talking about STEM education, and Dr. Nate, I know this is very uh, a very dear subject to your heart. Students all across the country, should they have been allowed to view the eclipse, or should they have been shuttered away in their classrooms with the blinds closed? There are two uh, sides to this, at least two. Uh, one is when uh, schools think about liability, which is a very, very much a reality, they say, no, we, uh, students should not be viewing the eclipse because someone might accidentally look up and damage their eyes. We don't want to be liable. Uh, the other says, well, that's the very reason why some people don't do experiments, because they're afraid that students will uh, violate safety codes, not knowing that students can be engaged enough that they will comply uh, for the most part. Um, then another side says, well, it would be good that uh, individuals are with supervised experts versus being with family members. So it's a debate that goes on. 
I think you fall on the side of those that think they should see it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I know our folks in Charleston would hope that most of, uh, most of the country was witnessing that. And so we're going to join Victoria with an official from NASA. Victoria? You got it. Thanks so much. We have El Sayed Talat. He is, a, I, I said you're a scientist with NASA, but your title is really a lot longer, right? Uh, well, I'm chief scientist in the Heliophysics Division at NASA headquarters. And this was your very first eclipse? How was it? Yes, it was fantastic. It was very, it was more amazing than I can even describe. I mean, I was excited. I couldn't take my eyes off the sun, of course, with the eclipse glasses uh, for over 10 minutes. And it was just, it was magical to see if day turn into night and then back again into day. I've never experienced anything like it. And your kids are with you. You said they were a little disappointed because of the cloud cover. They were, but they got, they got to see the partial eclipse the whole day uh, for a couple hours. And then, uh, unfortunately, it was cloud cover right when the totality happened. So they didn't get to see the corona because I was building it up. The outer atmosphere of the sun that we can really witness uh, in a special way, a rare way, uh, during a total solar eclipse. We can't see the lower part of the corona any other time. Uh, from the ground or even from space. All right, while it has gotten light for us once again, NASA is still very much at work because you guys are going to watch this from a Coast Guard ship. You're going to watch it hopefully from the International Space Station. That's right. The International Space Station is going to see it three times. They're going to see a partial eclipse each time. And then uh, I think 38 percent, then 44 percent uh, of the sun is going to be eclipsed. And then the last one is uh, 80 percent, uh, 88 percent eclipsed. So they're going to get to see it from the space station. We, we're observing it with 11 different spacecraft, uh, both looking at the sun and looking at the Earth. Uh, we have we had telescopes that uh, citizen science telescopes along the way that looked at the path of totality and balloons as well. And quickly, I know that this isn't done for you. You guys are doing some uh, some pretty cool studies on the corona, right? Yes. And in fact, uh, next year in 2018, we're launching a spacecraft that's flying into the corona. It's a it's a Parker Solar Probe. It's humanity's first uh, first mission to our star. Thanks so much. This was spectacular. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, we're going to send back to Beryl in the studio. Beryl. Thank you so much, Victoria, and thank you. You know, just up the road a piece from us in Newberry, I know that they are conducting some experiments. I'm just curious if we had all of this hoopla and then two and a half minutes and it's over, but it's not over yet. No, well, we'll still be observing the weather. Um, you know, you go back in time, back in 1900 when we had the last total solar eclipse here in South Carolina, the then U.S. Weather Bureau sent an expedition down to Newberry, South Carolina, about 40 miles northwest of here, to really observe what happened uh, during that eclipse. And uh, the Weather Service actually has two meteorologists out there right now taking the same observations from the same property, just to really kind of recreate that environment back from 1900. And I was actually looking at the data from there, and, and very similar to here, they were up to 94 degrees and dropped down to about 89 once the eclipse moved through. And we found back in 1900, the drop in Newberry was about three to four degrees. So this is just a little bit greater, uh, this temperature drop. But again, this total solar eclipse lasted almost a full minute longer than it did back in 1900. So we would expect temperatures to, to cool off a little bit more. And does that mean the next time when there is that seven minute eclipse you talked about that we could expect the temperature drop to be even greater? Possibly. Yeah, I would think the longer you, you, you lose that solar radiation coming in, the, the greater uh, temperature drop could be. I'm just curious about when it, if, if it ever has a more permanent effect or if the eclipse is just truly a, a momentary event that comes, makes its mark, and disappears. Yeah, I've, I've looked at some research, and I, I suppose there is the possibility of some longer-term effects, but those are kind of harder to really say it was the result of the eclipse, for example. Um, it, it's going to be so subtle. Even what we saw here, it was fairly subtle. A couple of degrees, maybe a slight decrease in cloud cover, but to look at the, the, the large picture and how the weather patterns change, let's say, across the United States or across the globe and, and say that was due to the eclipse would be pretty difficult to do. Okay. Well, in the celebration of light and dark, the Midlands is unveiling an art installation which is in progress right now. It's only the only one of its kind in the country, so let's take a look. Southern Lights is a large-scale lighting installation that's being done by artist Chris Robinson using laser light. 
The idea was concepted by an idea hub here, which lives under the umbrella of Ingenuity SC. It's called What's Next Midlands. And it's a place where anyone can go to submit an idea, big or small, for how to make the Midlands a better, cooler place to live. And so this idea came from someone who said, you know what, let's light a bridge. So the main portion of the installation will live between the Gervais and Blossom Street bridges with smaller, more intimate installations to view along the way. Chris is an artist that has done this sort of work for years using lasers and laser installations, light installations, and really exploring the boundaries of art and science. Uh, he's always had a fascination with the, with the idea of laser light, its coherentness, its sort of structural quality. He was looking for a sort of large scale piece that would really define his career, and I think this is it. The South Carolina State Museum is actually going to be maintaining the piece and treat it as if it were an exhibit. And one of their exhibits in the museum is dedicated to the late Dr. Charles Towns, who invented the Maser and then was later credited for inventing the laser. So we're really proud that this piece represents as well a native South Carolinian and an invention that's had such a significant impact on the 21st century. As uh, Chris will often say, you know, lasers cut fabric. They um, help manufacture automobiles and they scan your groceries at Walmart, but we don't often see them or experience them in person and in this particular way. So this is going to be a really unique way to experience laser light, light form that we very rarely see. I think this piece does several things. Uh, it First of all, it, it highlights the unique quality of laser light, that something that people don't often get to interact fairly closely with or see in this way and it showcases a fairly high power as well. The piece also showcases the rivers and, and kind of highlights a unique feature of our city in how it's kind of a, a quiet contemplative space in the middle of a big city. This kind of project is expansive and, and that's another unique part of this piece is how large scale it is stretching between two bridges. I think that this piece is something unlike any other city has to offer. Southern Lights is significant because it's going to be the only installation of its kind in the United States. And the reason for that is there aren't a lot of long-term laser installations. In fact, there aren't a lot of laser artists. Chris is one of just uh, a few people in the world who does installations like these. So it's a really big deal. There is one other one in the world and it's in London. It's something that really can define us, and I think it has such good roots in the history of Charles Towns being from South Carolina, and we have such an opportunity with our rivers, and this is something that can really showcase our rivers, showcase how the Midlands is all united under art, and be a piece that we get recognized for nationally. And for our radio viewers, of course, we were looking at what amounts to really a laser light show over the Congaree River. Southern Lights is unique largely because of its ambitious scale and its artistic intricacy. However, the organizers do predict it will be completed and operational nightly in 2018 when it will light up the sky for three hours each night. Speaking of lighting up the sky, let's see what's lighting up those gardens in Clemson. Gavin? Thanks, Bro. Yes, the sun is back out here, and so is the heat and humidity that we so sorely missed. <laughs> um, and so is Patrick McMillan, who is the host of SCE TV's Expeditions with Patrick McMillan, and he's also a professor here at Clemson University. Now, Patrick, I know we just spoke a moment ago about you experiencing the eclipse in the 70s, uh, but what other natural events have you experienced in your travels? Uh, well, I've, I, I'm lucky I get to go everywhere. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people would say, like, how does it compare to other celestial events like the aurora borealis or the aurora australis which i've seen both and you know those are moments that kind of you almost miss because you realize they're there you know but they're not really their experiences and while i've seen some auroras that danced across the sky and left you breathless it's not that extreme rush that you get knowing that you have two minutes and 37 seconds of your life 
to look on something that may not happen again in your life, you know, and we just lucked out because the clouds parted. I mean, I was really worried yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and they parted at just the right time to, to give us that opportunity mm -hmm. today. So um, as far as, as celestial events go, you know, this is it. Yeah. I mean, you don't get anything better than this. When I know your students are already hooked, they're obviously majoring in, in science degrees. Sure. Now, did we make across the country today maybe millions of new scientists, especially some of these young kids out here witnessing this event? Do you think that we're going to see a, maybe a rush in people interested in science because of this? How could you not? I mean, you know, to, to be out there among the people like I was um, at the moment of the clips and see little girls bouncing up and down, you know, enjoy. You know, I just hope that those, those girls grow up to be women who are interested in science and who can transform what we know. I mean, every time there's an eclipse, we're gaining knowledge because every time there is an eclipse, we've advanced, you know, mm -hmm. and so many things, so many discoveries and, and, and things that happen in life are started with one experience that you'll never forget. And what, so what are some takeaways maybe that you might bring into the classroom earlier this year once we start classes back mm -hmm. or, or what do you think that, you know, some of the data that we might see coming out of this, where do you think that's going to go maybe in the future and, and be applied to maybe in, in your areas of study or others areas of study? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I mean, for, for my area of study, um, I'm not sure we made any major breakthroughs. <laughs> for earth sciences, for understanding of gravity and things like that, of course, we learn stuff all the time from eclipses and I'm sure it'll be taken away. I think the one thing that my students will never forget is this week when they started school there was an eclipse. Well, great. Well, thank you, Patrick. Thank you for joining us out here in Clemson. And we're going to send you right back to Beryl, who's in Columbia. Thank you so much, Patrick and Gavin. You know, Dr. Nate, listening to that, I, I think the one thing that, that really intrigues me is the idea that for those few minutes, science becomes something that everybody relates to, not some obscure discipline that's difficult and uh, inexplicable. It's something that we all can access and relate to because of that personal impact. Absolutely, absolutely, Bill, you're, you're right on target. This is why we have been advocating in the latest revision of the science standards to have students actively involved in investigations and not be talked at because once they're engaged, then the science or the content and the process of doing it plus the attitudes become more real to them and touch them in greater ways than uh, just uh, them marching through as passive participants in the learning process. No, it's understandable why we in the continental United States would be so excited because of the way it went literally from sea to shining sea. But people around the world seem to have been equally as intrigued by this eclipse. Why is that? Uh, one, it's because it's an unusual phenomenon. We as human beings are always attracted to the unusual. Um, while it's not going to be in the continental U.S. for quite a while, it will be in other parts of the Earth. And so some of these travelers make tracks around the place just to <laughs> review such a phenomenon. They are the true umbra fields. Yes. All right, Victoria, what's happening down there? Hey, Beryl, right now, well, as you can see, uh, the uh, area outside the library has cleared out. The college students have left. I guess they have classes tomorrow. And we have John Hakala. He's an astronomy and physics professor. And you've also been the expert, basically, telling students what's going on. Yeah. So how was it? You've seen several eclipses. This is my third totality. And uh, this was different because it was cloudy. But I've never been in the middle of a crowd before. That was a new one for me. I think people forget that right now that we have partiality. And you're going to show us how. Can you, can you show us how this works? I hope so. Of course it did. Well, let me ask you a couple questions, and that way, if the cloud comes or the sun comes back, we can we can further uh, talk about that. You have a NASA scientist who's going to teach your class tomorrow, right? Yes, yes. In fact, we have a course. It's called NASA Space Missions, and it's a course where students design a NASA uh, planetary science project during the course of two semesters in conjunction with engineering students at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And Alex thought that would be interesting to come and talk to the class, and so he's uh, going to work his way in, and I think it'll, it'll be just perfect. What are you hoping your students and perhaps other young people across the country take from this eclipse? I would really like to see, let me take off my stupid hat for this, <laughs> but I, I would really like to see students across the country um, learn how wonderful science is and how the predictions that, made from, that are made from science 
are the kinds of things that we look for in developing models and making observations. These eclipses have been planned for years. We've, we've known that it was going to happen because our models are good. And uh, so when it actually happens and it's not something that's a surprise, I, I think that that's a good learning moment for students. And I think you described it best when you told me earlier, earlier this week that it's when astronomy comes to you. Yes, this is one of the few, in, in astronomy we're making, uh, we're, we're making observations that are based upon very little light. We need to look through a telescope. We know, need to know exactly where to look and what to look at. And uh, this is one of the few cases where we don't have to go to the astronomical event. The astronomical event comes to us and it's a great teaching moment. It certainly came to us today in Charleston. Thank you so much. Thank and we're you. gonna toss things back to Columbia with Beryl. Beryl? Thank you so much, Victoria. And we have been joined by a very special guest. We are really excited here because General Charles Duke, the astronaut who was the 12th human to walk on the moon as the uh, pilot of the lunar module in Apollo 16. That's correct. Has joined us back to South Carolina in your roots. But now, is this your first eclipse? It's a first total eclipse, yes. I've seen uh, one or two others that long ago, and I don't remember where, but uh, this was the first total one, and the weather just turned out fantastic, didn't it? Absolutely. It was so exciting. Well, how exciting can it be for a man who's walked on the moon? <laughs> well, it's a different experience, you know, that uh, we, uh, up on the moon, uh, the excitement was just the wonder of it all, the beauty of the moon and the, the rough terrain and the uh, uh, barrenness of it all and just the wonder I'm on the moon and you look up into the blackness of space and uh, and uh, with, uh, with no stars of course because the sun's shining but then down here to see the moon where I walked come in front of the uh, of the sun was just an incredible experience yeah well I, I, and this may sound like a, a, a foolish question but sitting on this side were you able to actually ascertain areas where you may have been before well no it was dark of course the, you, the new moon you can't really make areas out but I know uh, that uh, what we, the area was generally in the center of the of the dark moon we were a little east and a little south of the center of the moon where our landing spot was. So, you know, you can sort of look at a circle and figure out a little just pretty close, but you can't see much. I was talking with our guests earlier about the fact that you, you, you gather what seems like just minuscule information, mm -hmm. and yet you think uh, somewhere down the road it, it's obviously a valuable trove of, of information to have. And we know that you did that in the moonwalk, uh, those geological samples that you collected and things of that sort. Yeah, not only the geological samples, but we had a whole suite of experiments that we uh, did. We had a, uh, a camera that took uh, pictures in the ultraviolet and far, uh, far ultraviolet uh, spectrum, uh, which you don't see with your eye. Uh, and we had a, a solar wind collector, we had the seismic experiments, we had uh, penetrometers, uh, we had uh, uh, magnetometers and mass spectrometers, so a whole suite of scientific uh, experiments that we left on the moon and collected a drove of information. What do you think is, is the, the most beneficial aspect of having you this eclipse? Well, uh, overall, I think it was a national resolve that uh, President Kennedy put in our hearts as an American, as Americans, that we can do it. And uh, this is, uh, as he said, we're, we're going to build stuff that's never even been invented yet. We're going to use t procedures that haven't been even thought of yet. And we did. And there were 400,000 people gainfully employed uh, during the Apollo program and it brought so much technology and so much innovation to our lives that we experience today. Do we build on that when we do things as we are doing right now with this solar eclipse and the experimentation that's going forward? I think this? so, especially for the younger kids. Uh, we're really focused now in ed our educational system on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and uh, this e event, uh, I spoke to a group last night, uh, a private group, and these kids were from like three years old to 12 years old. And, uh, and, and they were so fascinated about what they were going to see today. Uh, and so that will stimulate them, that one event will stimulate them uh, to uh, 
inquire about the future in science, technology, engineering, or math. So I think it's going to be very helpful. And our economy in South Carolina is becoming more and more uh, uh, robust and, uh, and high tech. So we're going to need a real education, uh, 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 young people coming up. So. And that's science education. Yeah. Well, we're so delighted that you shared this with us. Is there one word you would use to describe this experience? Uh, super fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Two words. <laughs> General Charles Duke, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Beryl. We've got a guy standing by over at the ballpark, and we're going to go back and see what Tut's doing over there. Okay, Beryl, well, we are here at the ballpark with the Fireflies, and we got the president of the Fireflies, Mr. John Katz. John, what do you think of all this? That was probably one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in my entire life. What do you think the crowd, I mean, everybody was yelling and screaming and stuff. I mean, they obviously had a great time. Did they, uh, they calmed down, though, after a while, didn't they? Yeah, you know, it was, I think, at, when we got to the point where we could take the Eclipse glasses off, that was, I mean, that was spectacular. I mean, our ball players, our coaches, the umpires, I mean, both both teams, everybody just, I mean, they're really happy that, you know, not only were we playing, but, you know, the weather gods cooperated and we got beautiful, clear skies tonight. I saw you with the team lying down on the field. What was that like? It was great. You know, normally my groundskeeper doesn't let me step on the grass, but he let us lay on it today and it was, uh, it was awesome. Now, uh, we're leading, what, five to three, five to four right now? So do you think that the uh, Eclipse may have been a good omen that the Fireflies are leading? I hope so. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, this is just, you know, the, the power of an event like this to bring people together. And we had fans from 34 states come to the ballpark today for the Eclipse game, and that's really exciting. That's amazing. So how are you going to top this? We're working on that. We're working <laughs> on that. I'm going to have to make a few phone calls and see what I can work up next year. Okay, well, we're going to toss it back to uh, Beryl. Beryl, back at the uh, State Museum. Thank you, John Katz. Beryl, back to you. Thank you so much. You know, it was interesting talking to General Duke because he said his granddaughter was down at the College of Charleston and had just tweeted him about that fantastic <laughs> experience. So generationally, they enjoyed the thrill together. together. We've got satellite maps. Yeah. What's I was going just, on? I was just looking uh, the GO-16 satellite that just started uh, sending imagery uh, back to, uh, to the Earth here uh, earlier this year. I uh, got a great picture of uh, the eclipse from space. So not only are we observing it from the ground, um, like, like we have uh, we talked about already with the temperature drops and all, but we're able to actually see the effects of the eclipse from space uh, using satellite imagery and seeing you know, the actual shadow of the moon move across uh, the continental United States. And what does that look like? I mean, do you see the contours of the mountains or the craters more specifically? Or well, actually, it gets dark. It, it's um, you know, a visible satellite is pretty much taking a picture from space. So as the eclipse moved through the shadow, uh, that part of the Earth pretty much turned black as the uh, eclipse transversed the United States. So it's pretty incredible to see from the perspective of space. Dr. Nate, let's, let's talk a little bit about the speed of what's going on, because two and a half minutes just went by like that. <laughs> two and a half minutes went very fast because the moon is traveling, I put it in language that we could understand, over uh, 200,000 miles an hour. So that's uh, fast enough to get me back to my native Ohio in time for dinner. The moon itself and then... It's orbiting. It's orbiting the, at the, that the speed. Earth, the Earth at that speed, yes ma'am. You know, I've often wondered what's happening on the other side since we don't see that part of the moon when it's going on. Well, um, where there's, the moon doesn't have light of its own. So on the other side, there would be darkness because uh, there's no light source to illuminate it so that we can see it. And so it, there's not a whole lot going on. I found it pretty incredible that uh, General Duke would say this was a fantastic experience after literally walking on the moon. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the idea that there could be something that would parallel, if not exceed, his, his experience yeah, there. Yeah, I found that incredible as well. But I think all, all three of us sitting here just really felt it. And it, it was just different. It wasn't just nighttime. It just didn't get dark. There was something else to it. And to be able to experience that was pretty incredible. So here's someone that's been on the moon and actually say that, you know, this is one of those kind of moments. Is, is pretty neat, I think. Well, he hasn't been on the moon, but certainly Patrick McMillan has been in all sorts of places across <laughs> the globe. Patrick, maybe you'll be hanging out at one of them for the next eclipse. <laughs> oh, there's this Gavin.
Patrick is Patrick deserted uh, Thanks, bro. You? Patrick, Patrick left us, but uh, <laughs> he already left us here from South Carolina, the Botanical Gardens. But I'm sure he will be somewhere at the next Eclipse. They'll be way more interesting than the Botanical Gardens. Not that they weren't great. We really appreciate Clemson University hosting us here today. And I want to say thank you for joining us on behalf of myself, our crew, William, Gary, and Raven. We've enjoyed it, and I'm sending it to you, Tut. Okay. Well, we're ready. We're here. We are here at the ballpark. It's been a great afternoon. People are starting to filter away now. They've seen the main event, and I think that not all of them are going to stick around to see the uh, moon completely uncover the sun, but the rest of them are going to enjoy the ball game. It's been a great time, an awesome time with so many people enjoying themselves. And as uh, John Cat said, the, uh, the sky gods opened up the uh, clouds for us. We were very lucky. So uh, we hope that uh, everybody's enjoyed it here, and we're going to pitch back to you, Victoria, down in Charleston. All right, thank you, Todd. As you can see behind me, the uh, students here at the College of Charleston, they have cleared out all 1,500. You know, it is uh, school tomorrow for a bunch of freshmen. They say they start at 8 a.m., so they have to, I am sure, get ready to, to study. But we do have NASA here. They will be with us until 4 o'clock. They're still broadcasting live. They will follow the eclipse all the way out over the ocean. And again, they will be checking in with the International Space Station. It has been a pleasure to be a part of this. I send this back to Beryl. Thank you so much, Victoria. We appreciate that. Uh, folks are also, the crowds are dissipating here as well. My very special thanks to our guests, to Dr. Nate Carnes mm, and to John Q, better known as John Poirello. You got it. I got yeah, it at the you. National Weather yeah. Service. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you were tuning in via radio, via satellite, or via television. We've enjoyed being a part of your experience of this transcontinental total solar eclipse. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>